Hello, everybody. Um, welcome back to another episode of Transfigured. I am here today with Father John Strickland. Um, Father John is a, you are a priest at St. Elizabeth Orthodox Church in Palsbo, Washington. Um, you are also a host of um, the show um, Paradise and Utopia on Ancient Faith Radio. And you are also the author of books that are sort of connected to and expanded upon um, the content of your podcast. And your, your podcast is very focused on, um, uh, I would say, the history of Christianity from an orthodox perspective. And that's going to be the main thing that we'll, we'll talk about today. I feel like a lot of us in Western Christianity either haven't given much thought to Eastern Orthodoxy at all, and especially very little to what their perspective would be on the history of Christianity and how we got here and what that might illuminate or, or help us think about uh, sort of some of the blind spots and maybe our, our own historical or theological awareness. So I'm really excited to talk to Father John about that. Um, but would you like to introduce yourself and maybe tell me a little bit about your faith journey, your story, and how it is that you came to be an Orthodox priest and interested in history and all those sorts of things? Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, it's good to be with you today. I've, I've been looking forward to this. I enjoy your... Oh, your, I don't mean uh, to interrupt you, but I did promise to give Richard a shout out. Richard oh. uh, is a, a listener that connected us um, and said, hey, Sam, you, I, I love your podcast. You should really talk to Father John. He's, he's talking about some stuff that would be very interesting to you. So I just wanted to make sure that, that Richard was given credit for uh, helping make this podcast episode happen. Yeah, I want to do that too. I really enjoy Richard's work a lot on Dante. I think it's beautiful. Yeah, well, I, um, I've been doing this uh, project. Uh, you, you mentioned it's a kind of a history of Christianity, and, and certainly it is that, you know, for the first 1600 years or so, that Christianity was the driving uh, force for Western culture, but it's really more than that. It's um, or tries to be more than that. It's it's an effort at a history of the um, the culture of the West, the culture and civilization that we call the West. To look at that, um, a lot of people today would consider, certainly Christians would consider, the West to be in big trouble um, with its culture, and uh, different people have written different things about that. Um, and a lot of people will go back in time, not very far. Um, as I've often noted, you know, the sexual revolution seems to explain for a lot of people why we have certain elements in our culture today that we have. Uh, others would go back further to things like the Enlightenment, or they'd go back to the uh, Protestant Reformation. Some have done that. Back to nominalism, that um, theme in theology and philosophy, the the, uh, the late Middle Ages, so-called. Um, but but um, as an Orthodox Christian, I've often taught history, taught the history of the West. I've been doing this for, well, 25 years, I guess, or even more. So like a quarter of a century, it kind of dates me. Um, and I've, as an Orthodox Christian, as someone, you know, who's kind of, I hope, steeped in the piety and experience of, of the East, not the West, but who has, lives in the West and considers himself a member of Western culture and civilization, for sure, um, I see a lot that's like not discussed in, in those different perspectives. And so um, I'm convinced that really the solutions to the problems we face today, the answers, the questions we have about the West are, um, are best addressed if we go back into what might be called the deep past of, of the West, not the past 500 or so years, but back into the first millennium, go back a, a full millennium, a thousand years into that first millennium, and there I think we see a common culture, East and West, that is um, something we can build on, something we can look back to, something we can be inspired by. And it was a time when there was uh, one church in, in, in the West, in the East, in, in Europe, in what I call Christendom, that's my preferred term for this civilization. And, uh, and if we look back there, we find a particular kind of culture that's very different than what followed um, and, and which predominated at any given point in the aforementioned narrative from nominalism and the Reformation all the way up to the sexual revolution. What we see is a, what I call a paradisiacal culture, a culture that looks to the kingdom of heaven for um, directs its, the members of, of Western civilization toward the kingdom of heaven, which is convinced that the kingdom of heaven is not of this world, 
which um, is really important. Uh, sometimes people hear um, the term paradise, the age of paradise, like my first, not, my first book is entitled, and they think, oh, um, paradise was, you know, uh, accomplished or something. That's not what I'm saying at all. Paradise can never be fully at home in this world. The question is, is this world fully at home in itself, or is this world always looking to something beyond it, namely the kingdom of heaven preached by the gospel that, um, that brings fulfillment to it in a transcendent, transcendent relationship? And that is lost after the first millennium, and we're dealing, I think, now, a thousand years after the great schism or great division, we're dealing with the consequences of that loss. And so as an Orthodox Christian, um, I was once, you know, uh, I was once an Episcopalian Christian. I, um, I was, uh, 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 I converted to Orthodox Christianity at, while living in, um, in Russia. After the collapse of communism, I lived in St. Petersburg for a couple of years doing doctoral um, research uh, for my dissertation. Um, and there I converted to Orthodox Christianity. And since then, I've, I've kind of tried to revise my understanding of the long-term history of the West in light of, of the Orthodox uh, tradition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess to, to give you a little bit of background on, on me a little bit, I, I felt like there was a lot of what you're saying that I hugely resonated with. And then there are obviously a couple points of, of tension. So it, it seems, you know, what would a, a Unitarian Christian who is sort of like a Protestant of Protestants of Protestants and a, an Eastern Orthodox have to disagree about it, it would almost seem like we're on opposite ends of the spectrum in some ways. And, you know, that's, that's a little bit true. But one thing in my church growing up, our, in our self-understanding, our main distinctive was not necessarily the Trinity. That, that was one of them. But the, the thing that we most lamented about most of the Christians around us is that they thought sort of the goal of a Christian life was to die and go to heaven and to be on the right side of the divide in terms of what happens to you post-mortem. And that was almost the entire focus of the theology and the spirituality and the hope that a Christian should have is just simply dying and going to heaven. Whereas we, we emphasized um, that our hope is the resurrection, the hope is the renewed, the renewal of our bodies, and the hope is a kingdom on earth, right, of a, a complete unity of, of earth and heaven. Uh, and, and that sort of thing. And that's what it felt to us was, was like our strongest distinction was that the hope was uh, for this earth. The hope was for us. The hope was for these bodies that we are undergoing the beginning of a transformation now that would be finalized later. And so when I've been listening to your podcast and reading your books, I'm like, I hear that theme so strongly in what you're saying. And it, it really encourages me. Um, and, and that was something that I think uh, prompted Richard to connect us is this idea of, uh, of sort of the hope is a earth that is being transformed by heaven with the hope of their eventual full unity, not just an escape of our bodies to heaven, not just an escape of this life to some heavenly kingdom that's completely somewhere else. Yeah, I think there, you know, the way you describe it there, I think there's some interesting points of, um, you know, comparison there. Um, and, you know, I have, you know, very, very, very little experience with Unitarian Christian traditions and teachings and culture mm -hmm. and, you know, parish life, obviously, and that kind of thing. So I, I wouldn't be able to speak much about that. But um, that's, I guess, kind of what I'm trying to say, though, of what you just said is, is what I'm trying to say about that first millennium. Um, the first millennium was, was influenced as a culture, Christendom was influenced by a conviction that the kingdom of heaven has drawn near to this world. And, and I spent a lot of time talking about the incarnation and mm -hmm. traditional Christianity's doctrine of the incarnation, that God and man are united in the person of Jesus Christ, that divinity has um, assimilated uh, humanity uh, and that in Christ and in the body, the church that he created, um, the, the world has begun to participate in the eternal kingdom of heaven beyond this world. 
Um, I would want to emphasize that, as I understand um, the teaching of the Orthodox Church, um, and, and would teach it, and I do teach it because I'm a priest, we don't uh, think in terms of, you know, the renewal of this world in a kind of terminal sense. We see it as something that it will, will go beyond time after, you know, the second coming of Christ and the judgment and things like this, that that will be a, a total renewal that it, we can only begin to kind of, you know, <laughs> it's such a mystery. We don't really know what that's going to be like at all, but what we do do know is what we're told by the gospel and that is again the incarnation is real and so much so much um of the paradisiacal culture that i try to describe in say volume one of my uh series the age of paradise so much of that culture is shaped by the incarnation and here i bring attention especially to liturgy and the sacraments mm -hmm. um, those really are for me the core as i see it the core cultural force um, that shapes this culture we call the West. And it's only after, you know, a, many hundreds of years does that start to weaken. And finally, we're looking at something that's no longer traditional Christianity driving the West, but or shaping or cultivating it. But we, we're looking at secular humanism, which mm -hmm. is for me, and I talk about this in my most recent book, The Age of Utopia, which is for me a, um, a counterfeit of traditional Christianity, secular Humanism is a counterfeit. It's an effort to find an alternative to traditional Christianity and its transformational imperative, no longer looking to the kingdom of heaven for its um, transformation of the world, but now looking just to the world itself, the seculum, yeah. a, a neutral world. Yeah, I think that's a sort of a good overview uh, of the topics that, that we want to cover. So we, we've got a lot of history to cover. And then maybe once we've done that, then we can sort of get back into applying that to our current situation. Um, but I, I suppose let's go back to the beginning. How did, how did traditional Christianity in its origins incorporate this positive view for humanity, this positive view for the kingdom of God? And how did that sort of set the stage for the, I don't know, the ground soil, I guess, from which Christianity would go from there? Yeah, I, I think tr traditional Christianity um, from the beginning, from Pentecost forward, was very positive about, about humanity, very positive about uh, the, the cosmos, the world. Uh, I speak of an affirmative cosmology uh, rather than a negative one. Um, uh, and I speak about a optimistic uh, anthropology rather than a pessimistic one. I think that um, that this is this is clear from the scriptures forward, um, the earliest record we have of of Christianity. Um, the Gospel of John, for instance, speaks a lot about the the problems of the world, that the world you know is 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 broken by sin. Uh, if the world hated me, the world will hate you, he, he tells his disciples there, mm -hmm. Jesus does. But at the, the same gospel speaks about how God so loved the world that he gave to it his only begotten son. God loves this world. God came into this world and sent his only begotten son to it. And, uh, and Jesus assimilated um, our humanity uh, to his divinity to deify us, to, to fill us with his divinity. This is the uh, mystery of being made in the image and likeness of God, which Genesis proclaims and which Christianity fulfills. Um, and, and so I believe this is a very optimistic view of what the human experience in this life, in this age, in this world um, should be. And it's, it's played out from the beginning, um, from the beginning for three centuries. Uh, we can see this, this kind of proto-civilization of Christendom forming. Um, it's underground, you know, it's a catacomb uh, Christendom uh, at first, in many cases. Um, it, its culture is a kind of a subculture within the predominant pagandom. Um, Christendom is, you know, very small at first, but it grows in three centuries and it, 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 it doesn't await um, a government to, to protect it or um, advance it, as such as Constantine's conversion and the Byzantine state does in the fourth century. It's doing this already, and so we see from the beginning the um, the liturgy, the worship uh, of the church is 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 revealing the, the presence of the kingdom of heaven in this world. 
the sacramental life of the church, which is already in place uh, from Pentecost forward, um, is revealing the presence of, of, uh, of the kingdom of heaven in this world and man's participation in that divine experience. Can we, yeah, can we go a little bit deeper into that topic? Because that's a very important theme for your thesis <clears throat> is sacramentality. Could you explain a little bit more what you mean by that term and how we see that in the, the early church itself? Right, yeah. Well, you know, the early church uh, took very seriously. Um, I, I speak a lot about um, what I call doctrinal integrity, the importance of keeping intact um, a, a doctrinal tradition that we can trace back to Pentecost. Acts 2.42 kind of wraps up the account of, of what Pentecost um, was all about and what happens next. Acts 2.42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in the uh, breaking of the bread, in the communion or fellowship, and, and, and in the prayers. Um, the uh, Greek original there has a um, definite article in front of each of those four elements. So it's not the things in general are going on, it's specific, a specific approach to apostolic doctrine, breaking of the bread or Eucharistic communion, fellowship and, and church identity, and finally the prayers, the liturgical life of the church. And so I think we see a, a, an approach to liturgy, something, you know, a, a, a word that comes a little bit later, but we see approach to worship or liturgy which is very definite uh, from, from, that, from the beginning. And it's centered upon a sacramental experience of Christ's presence in this world through the assembled church. I mean, we go forward you know, to the end of that first century and we, we get to the epistles of St. Ignatius of Antioch, one of the early fathers of the church, uh, who's the first to use the word Catholic, for instance, as I understand it anyway. That's, that's where we first see the Christians using the word Catholic in, in its Greek original. Ignatius wrote in Greek, uh, lived in the Greek East. Um, and Ignatius talks about the church as an assembly around a bishop appointing presbyters or elders uh, at a liturgical gathering and a liturgical assembly and people sharing the chalice, sharing communion, sacramental Eucharistic communion together. And that is the experience of Christ's presence Christ is present. Christ is really here in this world when Christians come together to, uh, to, to assemble for the Eucharistic assembly, especially on the Lord's Day, on the first day of the week, which is why we're still doing that, you know, yeah. two, two millennia later on, on Sunday mornings as Christians. Beyond I, that, I, I think, doesn't Ignatius of Antioch call the Lord's Supper the food unto immortality or something like that? Mm -hmm. I believe he uses a phrase, either that phrase or something similar to that. And that's sort of what you're talking about, about how sacramentality connects with the, um, the early church's positive view of humanity and the positive view of the cosmos, sort of that almost in a kind of you are what you eat sort of way that the Eucharist is something that helps transform us into greater and greater likeness unto Jesus. And Jesus in his divine state is sort of like, coming down and lifting us up and moving us in that direction through the Lord's Supper. I That's think right. that, that that is sort of a, an image that, right, you, and you see that very clearly early in Ignatius of Antioch, and that that's sort of that connection between heaven, earth, humans, and sacraments that I think you're, you're sort of bundling. I think so. I think, I think so, Sam, and, and then I mean, it takes a while, and, and again, it's not that the uh, conversion of Constantine, the legalization of Christianity matters not, it matters a great deal, because then it frees the Christian community, Christendom, to begin elaborating, you know, how this sacramentality uh, plays out and influences the culture around it. It was already going on in the first three centuries, but after that important date of, you know, Constantine's conversion, 313, Edict of Milan, uh, if we want to date it there, um, then the church is, you know, is, is building temples and that sacramentality gets expressed in the very cultural, you might say, artistic uh, um, media of architecture and iconography and hymnography. Um, you look at architecture, for instance, it's, it's totally sacramental, East and West. Uh, in the Eastern case, uh, which becomes kind of the model for later Orthodox architecture, 
You've got the cross and square architecture, which emphasizes more or less a square um, building um, that is itself within that square cross uh, formed. And above it, of course, the, the, the well-known central dome that becomes so important in Orthodox architecture. That central dome is a, uh, is a symbol of the kingdom of heaven coming into this world. Um, the kingdom of heaven is drawn near, repent, Jesus says, uh, as he begins his ministry in the gospels. And so uh, this Eastern pattern of architecture that uses a central dome standing over the assembled Eucharistic as assembly um, is a symbol of heaven coming down into this world that you probably know. The overlap of heaven and earth in the participation of the, the liturgy and the religious services. A absolutely. You know, if you go out into a field at night and it's clear skies, it rarely is here in, in, uh, <laughs> in Western Washington, but when it is, uh, you feel like you're standing underneath the dome of heaven. <clears throat> and that's the idea. <clears throat> and then with time, uh, you know, an icon of Jesus is painted up in that dome known as Christ Pantocrator, Christ Almighty, looking down on his people ascended, assembled below him, uh, reasserting that basic principle that wherever the assembly of, of, of the church is for Eucharistic assembly, as St. Ignatius had said, under a canonical bishop in, in continuity and community and fellowship with, that, with the church throughout the world, wherever that happens, Christ is present there among them. The body of Christ is there at worship and the head Christ himself, the being the head, is there present with the church. Mm -hmm. I, this is the Eastern pattern, the Western pattern. Uh, we see this in the famous um, basilicas built by uh, Justinian in uh, Ravenna in, in Italy. But the basilica was more common in the West. The basilica is a long building, not the square kind of upwardly um, mm -hmm. oriented one, but it's oriented uh, toward the East where the altar table is located. Mm -hmm. And in marvelous cases of some of these churches, you see lines, iconographical lines of, of people um, on their way toward the East, toward oriented toward that altar, that, commun that symbol of communion with God on the walls. They're all facing and as it were moving in that eastward direction, orienting the people assembled there. Yeah, and could you altar. speak a little bit about what, what east symbolizes in, in that imagination? Why east, why instead of north, south, or west or something? Yeah, well, you know, the east, um, we learned from Basil the Great, who wrote in the, in the 300s, the fourth century, in a work called On the Holy Spirit. Basil was arguing why the Holy Spirit, and here I'll, I'll, I'll present my Trinitarian understanding of of, of, of God, the Holy Spirit, along with Jesus, Christ, the Son of God, is divine, um, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in, in, in light of the, uh, the Arian controversy, which asserted Jesus is a great man, but not divine, he's a creature, there was a time when, 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 the, when the Son of God was not, um, Basil and the other um, Eastern fathers, known as Cappadocian fathers in the technical uh, language um, kind of hagiography of the of the east they said no no that's not correct and they like Athanasius asserted that Jesus is divine as well as being human and then that opened the question that I was mentioning a moment ago with Basil is like so who's the Holy Spirit and Basil the Great writes a treatise called on the Holy Spirit in that fourth century which establishes um, within the orthodox tradition uh, establishes that the, the the spirit is divine well, that's all background to this point about orientation you spoke of and facing east, because as he lays out his argument, Basil says, so people might say that nowhere in the scriptures, uh, and this is I definitely, you know, um, arguable, but nowhere in the scriptures is there a proclamation that the Holy Spirit is God, the Holy Spirit is divine. But Basil says there are many things we believe that are part of an unwritten tradition, that are a part of a tradition that that from which the scriptures were actually written and canonized. And so he points to certain things that are part of the Christian tradition. And one of them is the um, practice, he says, of facing East in our worship, that we do this in order to remember um, that, that the East symbolizes our communion with God. It symbolizes the kingdom of heaven, which is now in this world and directionally, um, geographically like locatable. Of course, this is all symbol symbolism, right? But symbolism means something. 
Is it similar. connected with like sunrise and resurrection? Is that is that part of why why it's east? Partly, partly. Mm -hmm. So there, there are a few um, reference um, to to eastward worship, to oriented worship. And by the way, if people, you know, on on your program maybe aren't, aren't used to thinking th about this, the word orientation here is quite significant. You know, we think of freshman orientation or job orientation. What does that mean? It means like we we learn the we learn kind of what's what about our mm -hmm. job or where yeah. we're going. Mm -hmm. But orientation, when you think about it, means to face east. Oriens yeah. is the Latin for East, just like, you know, Occident. Oriental or something is an, an, an English word that means East. Yeah. Yeah. If you go to the Orient, you visit India or Japan or China or something like that. So it literally means East. And we learn from the scriptures, Genesis, that paradise was planted in the East. We learn furthermore um, in some of the prophecies about the Messiah coming to the world that he would be the son, S-U-N, of righteousness isn't that malachi's uh, prophecy of the uh, messiah that he is the sun like that kind of burning globe in the sky son of righteousness and there's this idea that the sunrise now becomes a symbol a cosmic symbol of the beyond cosmic reality of god's coming into this world the kingdom of heaven drawing near to this world and so all sorts of references can be made but we could go to the New Testament too. Jesus says, I think, what is it? Is it Matthew 25? Maybe you could help me with this. I think it's there where Jesus says that just as lightning strikes from the east, so the son of man will come in, in glory. And so there's a sense of like the east now symbolizes with the glory of the sunrise early in the morning, you know, like that sense of like, this is something God created a world in which a sun appears. We know it doesn't, it doesn't rise, but the earth spins. But a God-created cosmos in which the rising of the sun in the morning is given to us as a kind of symbol, cosmic symbol, of an eternal reality. And that is that God is coming in brilliance and glory and beauty and blinding um, uh, uh, power. And so the early church, yes, the early church began worshiping facing east, facing the east, facing the sunrise. You can still find this in modern Orthodox um, liturgical life, for instance. I'm sure you can find it in other non-Orthodox forms of liturgical life. But in the Orthodox Church, um, the service of Matins, uh, Orthros, Matins, that is um, the office of the morning that takes place during and kind of concludes when the sun rises, ideally, at the end of that, the priest raises his hands in the air and he says, glory to thee who has shown us the light. And the idea here is the sun is now rising and that there's this fulfillment of the nighttime vigil living through the darkness, you know, as a symbol of this world um, and, the, and Christ coming to us on, a, on this daily liturgical basis. Mm -hmm. So yeah, these are... I yeah. The, yeah, there's a, a Greek Orthodox church near my house, and uh, and I, I was like, I drove by it a, after I've been uh, reading your books, and I was like, okay, yeah, sure enough, it's a it's a kind of a cross square, and yeah, sure enough, it is facing east. I I <laughs> I'd driven by that building who knows how many times, and and had never noticed that until until you pointed that out. So um, a question that I have is how so what does Constantine's ascension change? And how is um, how is his role understood, and then the role of the emperors after him understood theologically? And what is the relationship then between empire and kingdom of God and church and and all of those things? Right. Yeah. Well, I, you know, as I presented in Age of Paradise, I think this is a very important point. Uh, a third of the book is actually pre-Constantine which is an effort at me to, to challenge a going conviction. You, you find this in all sorts of like popular accounts of Christendom, you know, I use that term a lot, Christendom, that Christendom is the product of Constantine and the uh, merger of church and state. And, and, and you can't have Christendom without a government that protects Christianity and advances its kind of, you know, its moral and spiritual goals. And when this collapses at the end of the middle ages, early modern period, Christendom is wiped out. I don't believe that. I don't, I don't use Christendom that way. I think Christendom is there from Pentecost. It's still there today. But in the case of Constantine and his accession to power <clears throat> in the early fourth century, 
this is just another dimension of, of the church um, uh, integrating into culture and civilization um, uh, 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 the kingdom of heaven, uh, seeing the kingdom of heaven working in this world. Uh, maybe nothing is more of this world than the state with its laws, you know, that are, you know, that are not voluntary, but coercive and, and punitive justice and, and killing and, and, and violence and wars being fought. And, and Constantine was part of all of that. That's why he waited so long to be baptized is he was afraid he'd be baptized, forgiven of his sins, and then he'd have to continue doing all the dirty work of government, you know, and he did some dirty work with his uh, son and his, uh, his, his second wife. Um, he had them killed, but, but uh, uh, the, the, the idea then would be, well, can we even talk about a state being um, baptizable, sanctifiable, capable of being integrated into the church's paradisiacal culture? In the East, you, you get a clear yes. In the West, you get ambiguity. There's no question in the West, this was a yes, but, but a very important um, um, statement of ambiguity is the famous City of God by St. Augustine, which really emphasized that there are really two, he creates a dualism here, really two cities, the kingdom of men and the kingdom of God, you know, and, and, and he, he's really critical and suspect of, of claims that we get from the East that Constantine's state can really be seen as kind of contributing to this paradisiacal culture. And we start to see, you know, we, we could talk if you're interested in, in what flows out of this distinction, but you start to get a distinction in Western Christendom of this dualism, of this mm -hmm. really, this, this eschatological gap, as one uh, great historian um, writes, that, um, that there's really a distinction between what goes on in this world and what the eternal kingdom of heaven has going on in it. The East, you don't have that so much. There's a famous uh, bishop named Eusebius that celebrates Constantine's conversion. He's the one who writes the, the second great history of the church. Um, people often think he writes the first history. He doesn't. St. Luke writes the first history <laughs> in, in the book of Acts, but he writes a history of the church and he celebrates Constantine's conversion. And he speaks like everything now is brought together. So there's this great optimism in the East when the, when the state now um, commits itself to being part of the of, 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 of Christendom, part of Christendom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so that happens. Now, what happens later, um, you know, if you're interested, we could talk a little bit about the historical narrative that, that comes next. Well, I, I guess part to a question that I have is, so um, in the, on this theme of sacramentality, um, part of it is that there, that, that the workings of the empire become somewhat sacramentalized themselves. And you talk about this in the, the coronation ceremonies of a, of a new Byzantine emperor. Um, could you talk a little bit about what, what, a, what a coronation ceremony was of a new emperor and how that connected with this sense of a greater unity instead of an eschatological dualism, but a greater unity between sort of the, this age and, and the kingdom of heaven? Yeah, right, sure. Well, you know, those ceremonies, you know, they, they first of all aren't there from the beginning. It takes a couple centuries before Byzantine Christians start to think, hey, you know, we really should ceremonialize, formalize the um, accession to power of a new emperor. You know, that takes a while. And interestingly, it's borrowed by the West. People like Charlemagne were trying to kind of ape or imitate that. Uh, he gets crowned by the Pope of Rome, for instance, and there were a couple before him, um, Frankish kings who had been crowned that way. But, um, but, but we see the church really now playing a role in blessing and consecrating in a sacramental way, I guess you could say, the, the statecraft that would be uh, in the hands of a new Christian, presumably Orthodox Christian ruler. And, this, and, and the church in her kind of, you know, her vision of a paradisiacal culture thought this was quite legitimate and, and important, something we've really lost in the modern West. We really, really love our separation, so-called, of church and state. You know, that's a really important mm -hmm. part about being American. And we have a lot of blessings that come from it, uh, some curses as well. 
but um, but we really do think that's important as modern Americans in, in the West, more broadly than just America too. Um, but it's an interesting thing that idea of a church versus a state. I think you you meant you kind of alluded to this. <clears throat> is a very modern concept. Um, it really only arises when, when, after the papal reformation, when you get the papacy asserting supremacy over the state in the West, and then the state reacts and, and fights against the papacy, right? And you get Henry VIII claiming that he as King of England is head of the Church of England, whereas formerly popes were claiming they were the head of the church throughout the West. You get this conflict that, you know, finally gets resolved after the wars of Western religion and the Enlightenment, which creates a separate sphere for church and state. And that's really secularization at work there. But for a millennium, you don't have that. Not in the East, but not even in the West. Charlemagne had a what would later be called a Caesaropapist vision of his role as a Christian ruler. And that is that the, the, the life of the church is somehow incorporated into his statecraft. Hence the rise of the filioque clause, which would separate Eastern and Western Christians so much because for, for Charlemagne and the Frankish Empire, it was important to use the filioque, and he finally imposes this or tries to impose this on the Pope of Rome, who at first resists and under Charlemagne's successors finally uh, adopts the filioque. Yeah, I, I felt like that was one of the things that I learned a lot from your book is like, I I knew a little bit about Charlemagne and I, I could have given you some facts on him, but I, I had no idea sort of the theological effects of, of Charlemagne and and the, the effects on ecclesiology that his reign and his ascendancy and his descendants had. Um, so, so could you talk a little bit more about that? Because I, I guess, one thing I hadn't ever really considered is when Charlemagne is trying to have himself crowned as the Holy Roman Emperor, there's someone else who thinks that that title belongs to them and that this is setting up a, a competition and a, a division and, and the seeds of, of future conflict. Yeah, and I think it goes back to your question earlier, which I don't think I answered very well, um, and that is the you know ceremonial um, way in which a new emperor was was recognized as emperor in the kind of the kind of liturgical celebration of that event the what one historian called the liturgification of life like all of life gets liturgified that is to say brought into the into the liturgical sacramental experience of the church <clears throat> in this very unitary cosmology of the east I mentioned Eusebius, who had a very unitary, it all gets kind of woven together. That, that doesn't mean there's not sin and darkness and, and all sorts of bad stuff going on. But overall, there's this vision of a, of a civilization and a culture, which is integrated into a unity. And, the, and when the government becomes Christian, it gets integrated liturgically into that unity as well. Whereas in the West, you've got the, the model of, 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 of um, St. Augustine with the City of God, which will only be acted on later in history, but which creates this, this kind of dualism that there's two different realities we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Now to your question about Charlemagne and, um, and his successors, and, um, and especially Charlemagne's relationship to the East. So what Charlemagne, you know, Charlemagne's crowned in 800 by the Pope of Rome. Uh, he had been ruling decades before that as a Frankish king, but now he gets, he gets um, crowned emperor of the Romans. Mm -hmm. Emperor of the Romans, and a crown is put on his head at St. Peter's Basilica in Rome by the Pope of Rome. Leo III was the Pope. And this happens in 800, right during the, the latter stages of the iconoclastic controversy and heresy in the East, where Byzantine emperors are actually advancing with the use of state violence, the iconoclastic, icon destroying policies of that movement. They had introduced it and they were advancing it. And in the West, this was, this was appalling. The Pope of Rome saw iconoclasm as a horrible um, misuse of power, earning a later term, it's anachronistic at this point, Caesaropapism, when the Caesar or emperor acts like a Pope with supreme authority over the church. Um, that's not a real, that's not an accurate, it's certainly not an historical understanding, but, but it, it's useful. So we could, we could talk that way. 
so in the West, Charlemagne is crowned in the context with, with contemporary events where you see the East kind of going bonkers over this iconoclasm and all the problems that it raises. And Charlemagne is crowned by the, by the Pope um, as the emperor of the Romans. Well, this, as you just suggested, fundamentally um, defies, if not negates or, or rejects the claims of those Byzantine emperors who had been in continuity, beginning with Constantine, both Christian and Roman. That, still... That's another thing that needs to be pointed out. I think a lot of Westerners have the idea that the Roman Empire ended in the four or five hundreds or something yeah. like that after mm -hmm. its decline, and that then the, the, there was no Roman Empire. And then, uh, you know, Charlemagne kind of thought he was, but it doesn't really make sense that he was. But a lot of Westerners don't realize is that from the Byzantine perspective, the Roman Empire never ended. There That's was right. just as Constantine was a Roman emperor, so were his, not necessarily his sons, but his, uh, uh, you know, uh, successors who were uh, in his line after him were just continuing the same uh, empirical threat. And, and so when Charlemagne is saying, hey, I'm the Roman emperor, you know, that, that is in direct competition with the claim from Constantinople. That's, that's absolutely right. Yeah. And they were using Latin at the Byzantine court. They were speaking of themselves as emperors of the Romans. They thought of the Byzantine empire as the, the Romans. That's what they called it. Um, mm -hmm. Absolutely co co continuous development there. Well, so you have this thing happen in 800. And what's interesting about it, Sam, is that on the one hand, you know, it, it totally alienates the East. The Byzantine emperors are like, are you kidding? Like, we're the Roman emperors and what's going on here? Like, why is the Pope who used to be in communion with us and still is, by the way, but nevertheless, why is the Pope turning to another power? And, um, and, and that, there's a couple interesting things. That's one, it alienates the East, it creates an East-West divide. Mm -hmm. On top of that, the East-West divide is greatly um, exacerbated by the fact that Charlemagne, now kind of gives orders to his, his bishops, the kind of uh, cultural elite of the, of the Frankish empire. He gives a signal that he wants them to begin generating theological treatises and other statements of identity and theology and so forth that are distinct from the East. And so actually what you get is you get a lot of uh, theological treatises by the Frankish theologians. Alcuin is the most famous in the so-called Frankish or Carolingian Renaissance, but there are others like Theodolf and, and others. And they begin, become very pejorative in using the term Greek. They dismiss the Greeks as like a heretical, iconoclastic kind of who knows what's going on out there in Byzantium. We are the true Roman Empire. We're the heart and center of Christendom. And, and you get this real and we're, effort. We're the ones that are more faithful to the teaching and the tradition, and we're safeguarding it against whatever those Greeks over there are doing. That's right. Yeah. And here again is another step toward the assimilation of what has now could now be called Augustinianism, mm -hmm. a distinct kind of um, tradition in the West. Uh, uh, there's Augustine and his writings, you know, like City of God and Confessions and others. And then there's the kind of assimilation and di digestion of those of that theology which follows some of it contested by latin fathers after constantine but now the franks see this as a a western legacy that they can oppose to the cappadocian fathers like basil the great and other eastern fathers who had this unitary vision of christendom unitary vision of culture and now more and more you see in in the in charlemagne's west a, a, a distinction from that arising yeah. and that brings if i could just say one final point of importance in addition to uh charlemagne's alienation of the east charlemagne's creation of a of a cultural um elite that dis distinguish themselves from the east as a as a distinct west the third thing would be the role of the papacy in all of this so the papacy now becomes tied to linked to the fortunes of the Franks and a distinctly Western conception of culture and civilization that right away will not um, will will not um, develop, uh, but with the, within a couple of centuries will become very very important. And so, the papacy, for instance, right now resists the use of the filioque, which the Franks were advocating. Mm 
In fact, the very Pope who crowned Charlemagne makes um, silver shields to put on the very tomb of Peter at St. Peter's Basilica with the Nicene Creed written without the filioque. Mm -hmm. In um, Latin or, or Greek? Both, actually mm -hmm. two shields, one Latin, mm -hmm. one Greek. And it's like, we will never ever adopt the filioque because it violates the ecumenical council's ban on changing the creed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but with two, within two centuries, by the early 10 hundreds, just before the great schism happens, um, the papacy has become so weakened and so dependent on these, the successors of the Frankish Charlemagne line that he adopts finally the filioque the Pope does. And from that point forward, the filioque is part of Western uh, uh, Christianity, Christendom. Right. So there's this sort of combination of forces that are starting to increase and grow the rift between East and West. One is Charlemagne claiming his um, position as the, Rome, the, the true Roman emperor. Um, one of the, another part of that is that the Bishop of Rome is the one recognizing that when previously I assume Byzantine emperors are, are coronated by the Bishop or the Metropolitan of Constantinople, right? Yeah, so, so part, yeah. so part, the Patriarch of Constantinople. So part of that is the, 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 the Roman Bishop claiming some authority over what had previously been Constantinople's prerogative. And then there is this also this theological creedal division um, uh, with the filioque. Filioque, just in case anyone doesn't know, it's in the, the Nicene Creed, it says the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. In Latin, the, that word it, filioque means and the Son. The Greek version, the original creed from the Council of Constantinople did not have the word and the Son in it. That starts to creep up sometime in the West. And then um, Charlemagne, perhaps both for theological and political reasons, starts to emphasize that, and it's a way of distinguishing again in a in the very heart of the Nicene Creed the the West from the East, and a reason why on either side the other side was wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got that. That's right. Yeah. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. And and so so what are what are some of the other theological and spiritual trends that you can sort of see in Carolingian Frankish Christianity that come to influence the the trajectory of Western uh, Christianity after that? Well, one of the things that I find interesting about the uh, Frankish uh, period uh, of Western Christendom, uh, which begins to set the West on a course distinct from where it had been before in the throughout the first millennium in which the, the East continued on, um, is the um, attention to reform, attention to correctness. Um, Charlemagne is known not only for advocating a uh, kind of a revival of learning, uh, use of Latin, he, he systematizes the use of Latin. I mean, you know, even going so far as to speci specify a certain script. Mm -hmm. um, he's very attentive to, and his bishops, you know, kind of fulfill this. He sends bishops out on mission throughout the whole of his empire. It's very vast. Um, stretches from like the, the borderlands of Spain all the way to Saxony and beyond in Central Europe. Uh, includes Italy now. Um, he, he begins um, uh, 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 trying to integrate and, and reform uh, the practice of Christianity. Uh, within his empire. I mean, hence the filioque. Mm -hmm. He wanted one form of the creed that used the filioque for very specific political missionary kind of um, reasons. The filioque asserts Jesus as God by saying the Holy Spirit, who is also God, uh, 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 proceeds from the, Holy, from, from the Son as well as the Father. And that asserts that the Son truly is God. This was used against Aryan Christians like in Spain and so forth that were still left over, as it were, um, and, and serves to assimilate them into Charlemagne's Orthodox empire. And or, Charlemagne is Orthodox. We shouldn't forget this. There's been no permanent split yet. So back to the Ref Reformation kind of thing. Charlemagne is all about reformation, reforming, trying to correct and, and perfect um, mm -hmm. ecclesiastical usage throughout his empire, which, which has great effects and in, in consequences in some cases. But it also... Um, sets a precedent for later Western ecclesiastical um, kind of administration that sees like the church as something 
like the practice of, of Christianity as being something that has to be corrected all the time and brought back into conformity with some sort of model. Um, of course, Protestant, Refor Protestant Reformation is the most you know, well-known example where Luther and Calvin and others are trying to bring Christian practice and belief back into accord with what they understand the first century apostolic experience related in the scriptures to be. Uh, Charlemagne's not like that as such, but he, for instance, revi re revises the mass, um, the, the Latin form of the, uh, uh, of the Eucharistic assembly. Um, he does other things like that. And so this is very important and it sets a precedent that will be picked up by the papacy itself a couple of centuries after Charlemagne. Mm -hmm. Could you also talk sort of about um, a greater emphasis on sinfulness, um, a greater emphasis on fallenness and how that relates to um, penance and purgatory and, and a couple other of those things that you start to see developing more and more in the West kind of in and after the time of Charlemagne. Yeah, and I'd say after the time of the so Charlemagne, so let's call it Charlemagne 800, uh, in the middle of the 11th century, 250 years later, occurs what's called the Great Schism. I, I call it, mm -hmm. culturally speaking, the Great Division, which division, schism, it's the same word, but I, I, can't, I think Great Division kind of helps us think about it a little bit more. It's more than just an ecclesiastical um, event. It's a cultural event as well. Well, by the middle of the 11th century, um, the papacy has um, resolved to um, assert leadership throughout the West in an effort to reform Christendom there. Uh, it had fallen Christendom, Christianity, Christian practice had fallen into, you know, a really miserable state. Uh, all historians agree with this. There's no, there's no controversy here. Um, local lords and, and lay leaders were in control of so much of Christian life, including the popes, the election of popes of Rome, the local uh, Roman aristocracy kept the papacy in its pocket for political and economic reasons. And there's this bursting, you know, Christianity is about transformation. That's something that goes through all my books. I talk about a transformational imperative that's built in to Christian civilization from the beginning. Uh, Romans 12.2, uh, be not conformed to the ways of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I think that transformation rather than conformity, but transformation of the world is a, um, a, a culturally creative element in, in Christianity from the start. And so we get the popes of the 11th century saying, we've got to, tran we've got to change this. Uh, and that transformational imperative is behind what they do. However, the way they do it is to um, advocate the creation of a new administration, administrative structure where they are the supreme head of everything in, in the West including the government, mm -hmm. um, instead of a unity or symphony between emperor and, and patriarch or bishops, as you had in the East, you now have um, a very clear hierarchical model where the Pope is the supreme head of every, everything and everyone in the West, including governments. And this begins the long conflict that Pope Gregory VII has with uh, Henry IV, the Holy Roman Emperor, you know, the famous... Uh, pilgrimage that Henry makes to the snows of Canosa and kneels out in front for three days waiting for <laughs> Pope Gregory to come out and absolve him so he can get back to ruling because he can't rule without the Pope's blessing. Um, this now creates that church-state divide that we were talking about earlier, but it also entails, brings in its, in its wake, other developments, which you alluded to, uh, Sam. One, for instance, is, is purgatory. Purgatory is a theological opinion that circulates and exists before the Great uh, Schism, before the Papal Reformation, but it only becomes dogmatic as a Roman Catholic doctrine uh, in the 12th century, it seems. Um, it, it became a dogma of, of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, how it's laid out is maybe different over time, and I'm not a specialist in this, and I'm not Roman Catholic, so I don't want to pretend that I can you know, say the, the final word about purgatory as a doc, doctrine, I can't. But I do know as an historian that it manifests itself throughout what we call the Middle Ages, a term I don't use in my writing, mm -hmm. um, in, in, in different ways to uh, emphasize uh, the, the terror, the horror of what will happen to someone when they die and will have to be purged, hence purgatory, 
purged of, of the effects of their sins. And there's uh, different ways of doing this. Um, uh, uh, there are different ways of, um, of talking about this. Dante, we are spoken to Richard earlier, mm -hmm. uh, Richard's done a wonderful job talking about Dante and how beautiful, beautifully he, he elaborates the purgatorial doctrine in the second volume of his Divine Comedy. But other accounts are very pessimistic, like uh, the Purgatory of St. Patrick, which appears at this time. It's an account of going into purgatory and suffering hell, essentially. Purgatory becomes a temporal hell that someone has to undergo after they die. So a kind of post-mortem punishment and suffering needs to take place before one experiences paradise. Well, I would say that this fundamentally subverts the paradisiacal culture of the first millennium. Because why? Because that culture said that we are already participating in and experiencing our salvation. Mm -hmm. Deification, the experience of, of union with God um, uh, and many other things, the liturgical sacramental experience of standing in one of those temples and, and seeing the kingdom of heaven symbolized over your head with that central dome or being oriented toward the altar. Um, these are experiences of joy and, and, uh, and, and harmony and, and salvation. And now, though these don't disappear from Western Christendom after the Papal Reformation, they get minimized and more and more the um, culturally pessimistic elements, such as the fear and horror of purgatory, begin to cloud that paradisiacal culture. And so, you know, that would be one, one way I would have of describing how after the Papal Reformation, this starts to happen. And purgatory is closely connected to that Reformation because um, mm. in order to obtain so-called indulgences from that punishment of purgatory, one has to receive from the Pope, the personally from the Pope, not from a local bishop, but from the Pope, a indulgence. Mm -hmm. These indulgences are introduced only at this time in the 11th century, Urban II, the Pope uh, who launched the, uh, the first crusade, spoke of such indulgences, fighting crusades and going to war, which formerly had been considered a, a, uh, a, a sin, <laughs> even if it was to defend your own country or even defend Christendom, it was still sinful to take the life of fellow human beings made in the image of God. Uh, now, now fighting such crusades becomes a means toward salvation itself. And so you get this kind of really militarized vision of um of salvation in the crusades and and legalized and almost transactional or something like that absolutely yeah yeah, yeah with time i mean that's what luther just couldn't couldn't take anymore and so many like him is that after 500 years of this um in in some cases and not always with the with the papacy's blessing but nevertheless it happened indulgences become transactional it just mm -hmm. oh, okay i'll pay this much money or do make this pilgrimage to this uh, shrine or sh saints relics hence the or enlist in this crusade or yeah 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 mm -hmm. and and go fight you know that's that's a little bit that's waning that has already waned and kind of faded by the time of luther but yes that's part of it as well mm -hmm. yeah and i think a lot of uh, a lot of protestants are to the extent that they're aware of reasons of the reformation know those sorts of things but i think they might not be aware of how localized that was to the particular western christianity that protestantism found itself in and that these developments were not there in eastern christianity uh, at the same time yeah and, and eastern christianity throughout this time and before it you know has plenty of problems and the orthodox mm -hmm. church has plenty of problems there's lots of violence in the you know in orthodox christians are killing each other i mean let's look at ivan the terrible i mean 16th century Yvonne the Terrible, contemporary of Henry VIII. <clears throat> I mean, talk about violence and, and statecraft gone totally bonkers in the, in, in the name of Christianity too. Yvonne the Terrible had a very strong Christian self-identity. Um, so we don't want to idealize the, the East in the sense that everything's fine. It's not. It never was and it never will be. But what we don't have are these cultural institutions like purgatory, um, crusades, the Inquisition. There is no institutional Inquisition. That grows out of the Albigensian Crusade um, of the early 1200s under Pope Innocent III, the same Pope who oversaw the sack of Constantinople in the East. And so you don't have 
<clears throat> pardon me, you don't have um, you don't have an inst an institutional inquisition, um, you know, using 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 governmental power to uh, supervise and detect and punish um, heresy. And, and a lot of this stuff is really accumulating by the time of Luther mm -hmm. and the Protestant Reformation. Um, so, yeah. Can I just say one last thing, though, about this, this mm -hmm. what is going on here? Um, penitential pessimism, which I you know, point to purgatory as being kind of a institutional doctrinal support for, not, not that purgatory is necessarily this way, it's just kind of culturally speaking has this effect, but also um, penance itself becomes seen, like you said, as a transactional thing, like I've committed certain sins, I go and I list those sins to a priest, the priest is seen now under the uh, clerical kind of system that exists as a servant of the Pope, and therefore the one with power to absolve me from my sins, and he, he's almost more important than my act of repentance is. Right. And, 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 so, and so that that principle of repent for the kingdom of heaven is drawn near is giving way to repent so that you can get out of punishment. Right. Or even help your loved ones out of punishment. Yeah. Yeah. Kind mm -hmm. of a very personal kind of, you know, effort yeah. to manage salvation and the experience of paradise. Yeah. Mm hmm. So how how does how do these forces sort of set up the, the the Protestant Reformation and and what sort of I guess the Eastern Orthodox view or maybe maybe there isn't one official view I, that that's not quite the right way to uh, to put it but what sort of an Orthodox perspective on the Reformation uh, so kind of the, those are two big questions, obviously, and we could go into numerous podcasts just on that. But some, yeah. what are the causes, and 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 how how is this viewed from the east? Right. Yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> for the first, you know, what kind of leads immediately to the Protestant Reformation? Um, I mean, that that obviously is a, a very well known uh, a, a subject of historical inquiry, and and people have done a great job talking about some of those things. Um, I would emphasize, uh, you know, with my own interests and such, I would emphasize that there's a, um, a, re a reaction to this penitential pessimism. When Luther, you know, goes to Rome on pilgrimage, he's actually assigned just to go to Rome for a kind of a local, um, um, it's kind of a business trip for him, for his uh, Augustinian monastery. But when he gets there, he uses, he acts like a pilgrim, and he goes up the steps, the famous steps um, in the Lateran Palace that were said to have been brought from Pontius Pilate's uh, temple, or not temple, but uh, palace that Jesus had to walk up. And so this becomes a pilgrimage site. And what I was saying earlier about um, the purgatorial culture or ethos is certain acts now become like salvific in the sense of if I perform these in this transactional way, I'll get, I'll obtain some, some measurable benefit, mm -hmm. such as less time being punished in purgatory. Well, formerly, pilgrimage had been an experience of paradise, <laughs> right? I mean, wow, this is, this is where Jesus was, and, and Jesus is present here in these steps, and I'm participating in this world, in this life right now, physically touching the, the penetration or breaking in of paradise into this world in the incarnation of, of Jesus Christ, or going to pilgrimage sites like saints relics, which Protestants become so negative toward. Why? Because they had become so uh, transactional, so institutionalized, so legalistically defined as to go to saints relics, you'll get this and, and you'll, you'll escape purgatory for a certain, certain amount of time. And this saints worth this amount, this saints worth this amount. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you go to a priest and you make your confession and like, I've done this, 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 and this. And it's almost like the, well, the priest would literally pull out a kind of a table and say this, okay, this many Hail Marys, and you've done this, you have to do this to get out of that, and make a pilgrimage here, this kind of thing, and I don't want to over, like, emphasize, you mm -hmm. know, the, the, the problems, dysfunctionality of this, I mean, there's a lot of beauty and good stuff going on in the salvation of the human race uh, in, in, in Western Christendom on the eve of the Reformation, but people like Luther, you know, finally, they're brilliant and creative, here's the second part of your question, um, and there are a lot of other reasons why the Protestant Reformation occurred, but, but here's the second part of your question. From an Orthodox point of view, people like Luther um, 
made the decisions they made, um, uh, you know, uh, Cranmer in England and Calvin in France and Geneva, <clears throat> they made the decisions they made to break from the Roman Catholic Church because of that same reformational element that had started to creep into Western Christendom under Charlemagne, as I mentioned, and then it had really been institutionalized by the papal reformation of the 11th century. Um, now it's part of the culture of Christ, Christ, Christianity and Christendom. And so now it's time to reform yet again the, the faith, reform it. And this attention to reform, which is very, can be very external, rather than transform, as Paul says in 12, Romans 12, 2, rather to be transformed mystically uh, through the experience of communion with God, which had been at the heart of paradisiacal Christendom for a millennium and was still very much a part of paradisiacal Christendom in the Orthodox East at this time. Well, it's, it, there's so much attention to reformation uh, rather than transformation that Luther and Calvin and other reformers look very much to an Orthodox Christian, very much like you know, the heirs of, of Pope Gregory VII of Rome. And, mm -hmm. and you know, my, my second volume, The Age of Division, has, as it were, you know, historical bookends of the Papal Reformation of the 11th century and the Protestant Reformation of the 16th and 17th centuries. And I see this as all being kind of part of one civilization Whereas Protestants and Roman Catholics will see it as being a break, like a, a completely different, you know, kind of approach to things, Luther forward uh, mm. or, 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 or going backward in time. And, and I see it from the East as being really two sides of one coin. Mm -hmm. And I, I can imagine that there's sort of two tugging tensions that an Eastern might view the Protestant Reformation like, well, yeah, I can certainly understand what those Protestants were upset about. If you look at their list of grievances, I might agree with a good chunk of it, but the schismatic and the anti-authoritarian, anti-clerical, anti-structural, however you want to put that element. And anti-liturgical, anti-sacramental, anti look at Calvin's, mm -hmm. you know, efforts to reduce the sacraments, yeah. Although one question that I that I had about that is, is you know, at, as a Unitarian, I'm like only so loyal to Luther and Calvin, and Calvin wasn't so nice to non-Trinitarians, so we don't tend to like him very much. But um, one, one thing that I, I think that Luther and Calvin and a lot of the other reformers were motivated by was the fact that communion and the Lord's Supper had been so clerically oriented mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. the common man maybe participated in it once a year or, or something like that was a relatively common practice, mainly out of kind of perhaps too much fear uh, that to participate in it in an unworthy state would be counterproductive. So then you only maybe do it once a year, normally around Easter or something like that. And a lot of the reformers are like, no, we need to bring this back to the people. We need to take it away from those special, from the special reserve of the clerics and then again, share it with the people. And I can imagine making an argument that in certain ways that the Protestant reformers are in, interested in spreading the liturgical participation, even though they might not have used those words, but that this is one of their motivations to, to spread it to greater common participation. And in that way, I'm not sure if anti-sacramental is always necessarily a fair representation, although I, I also do kind of know what you mean. Yeah, let me, let me say two things about that. One, I totally agree with what you're saying. Your, your interpretation of what they were trying to do is I think quite correct. They were trying to, they were opposing and rejecting um, with a lot of vehemence the convention that had crept into the West of, of, of what I call the bifurcation of Christendom between a clerical elite and a lay kind of uh, whatever the elite is not. <laughs> um, the clergy, more and more after the Papal Reformation, because of the dynamic and, and logic of the Papal Reformation, right? The clergy become integrated into what now is known as the church, right? I mean, how often do we, in, even in modern times, say the church, you know, so-and-so is, is on the outs with the church. By mm -hmm. church, we mean clergy. Yeah. But that's a crazy, I mean, that's a completely un, 
um, scriptural, untraditional, non-traditional way of defining the church. The church is the body of Christ. It's everybody. In, yeah. In, it's, the, it's the assembly. That's what the word means in Greek. It's the people gathered together. Yeah, the kahal, the ecclesia, the yeah. drawn out from the world with a special purpose and identity. That's what the church is and includes the laity, which makes up the majority of it, that participate ideally as much as the clergy in the experience of the kingdom of heaven in this world. But what happens with the papal reformation is because of the logic of, of, of influence and reform and, and administration, the Pope create, the papacy creates a kind of a hierarchy that, that then is cut off and especially over around the question of a clerical celibacy uh, creates a divide between the clergy and everyone else, the laity. Clerical celibacy, you know, historically had a very legitimate place east and west in, um, in, in, in the church's kind of uh, assignment of clerical positions. In the east, parish priests were all married. I'm married. I have five kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Pat, the average parish priest was married. In the west, that was less the case, and there was more of an expectation of, of clerical celibacy. But what happens in the Papal Reformation in that very 11th century is people like, people like Peter Damien make a really, really strong case against um, clerical marriage, saying uh, for the following reasons, that it defiles a priest to have relations with his wife um, and still be overseeing the holy things on the altar table. Mm -hmm. you know. And he, he really, I, he gets quite graphic about it actually. And, and that's, a, that's really a, a, a development that, that suggests then when it becomes institutionalized as it does in the Roman Catholic Church where no priest may be married, it institutionalizes a sense that if you're married as a layperson and you're engaged in normal marital relations, you're somehow defiling yourself. Mm -hmm. And take that Augustinianism that I mentioned earlier. Yeah, Augustine, not just anthropological pessimism, but sex negativity, I guess you could call it. Yeah, I mean, it breeds that for sure. Yeah. And, and then if you take Augustinianism and it's, it's uh, you know, the, the claim that, you know, sexual desire for one's lawful spouse is itself concupiscence and a desire for something other than God and therefore inherently sinful, even if it brings forth children, this kind of thing. I mean, that's just, that wasn't part of the Eastern Christian ethos of the first millennium and it's not beyond. Mm -hmm. But that also is a big part of why, back to your question about sacramentality of the Protestants, why they were why they were so anti-Roman and why they wanted to emphasize the laity's now reintegration um, mm -hmm. into a sacramental life uh, around the Eucharist. You're right, Luther wanted regular communion and especially for everyone. I think he wanted both kinds, right? Because yeah, the yeah, yeah, bo both both elements instead of just the lady getting the the bread only. I think that's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Calvin too, who I called an anti-sacramental, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Calvin too thought that that communion should be a regular thing because it wasn't, like you said, so yeah. once a year sort of I, thing. I think there's even a, an event in the Council of Geneva where they're trying to negotiate how often the laity will receive communion, or how often, it, not just the laity, how often everybody, anybody receives communion. And Calvin's saying, we need to do it weekly and everybody needs to take it weekly and that needs to be the center. And some of the other council members of the city who maybe are maybe still have one foot kind of more in a Catholic mindset and aren't quite so sure about this whole new Calvin thing, are saying ah, that that that's too much. You know, we only used to do it one once a year, and so they kind of arrive on once a quarter, I think, as sort of the compromise. But instead of the Catholic-oriented people saying do it every week, and Calvin saying don't do it very often, it was actually the opposite, where Calvin was pushing in in the direction of greater frequency, but he had to compromise in the middle at once a quarter, which an amazing number of Protestants still only do it once a quarter because of that that uh, compromise uh, once upon a time in the city of Geneva. But but that's sort of to my point that in a certain way the reformers actually were more concerned about greater sacramental participation for um, the entire church? Well, yes and no. So definitely we've, we've established, I think we both agree that there was an obvious emphasis placed by Luther, Calvin, and other Protestants on greater access to the Eucharist by the laity and greater frequency of that access, yes. However, I would not agree um, on the second point 
that it was more sacramentality in general. It was limited to the Eucharist and only a Eucharist understood in a certain way. Um, it's it's uh, it's uh, John Knox of, of Scotland, founder of the Presbyterian Church with its Calvinist roots, who said um, against the more Catholic, you might say Roman Catholic, sacramental, liturgical uh, Anglican Church about the Eucharist that Christ is in heaven and not here <laughs> when it came to the material uh, dimension of the Eucharist. He's in heaven. He's not here. That's John Knox drawing. And certainly Z Zwingli was also very much a non-realist in, in communion. But in Protestantism, there's, there's a spectrum because Luther had consubstantiality. He didn't like transubstantiation, the, the, the Aquinas, um, you know, articulation. But, you know, uh, my, my wife grew up Lutheran and, and they, they get taught that uh, with Jesus is within and under or, uh, and what is that? that means I'm not quite sure but but and Calvinists some of them still emphasize a real presence which is again a, a re-articulation kind of denying spiritual some presence yeah spiritual presence denying a kind of I I think what had happened I I had an interview with Brett Sockold who's a Catholic theologian and he uh, specializes in in uh, Euch the theology of the Eucharist and the disputes during the Protestant Reformation and and he said something interesting that that once upon a time when Aquinas was describing transubstantiation, he was he wasn't saying that there was any physical change, right? It was a change in the substance, but he understands substance as something only apprehended with the mind. And that's not actually that different from what Calvin was saying when he's when Calvin is saying, well, no, it doesn't actually change into the bread and body of Jesus or into the blood and body of Jesus. It, it's something that you understand with your mind. And Brett Sockold actually said that Calvin, in a weird way, is actually way more similar to Aquinas than he or his Catholic contemporaries realize. So I'd be, I'd I, be interested in looking at that. I, I sometimes I'll... think, but but I also do agree with you that especially over time, the more Zwinglian, it's just memory. It, if anything, spiritual presence gets sort of downplayed and the, the main purpose of it is to remember the crucifixion as opposed to in that kind of way that I quoted from Ignatius of Antioch, eating the food that renders unto immortality. That, that sort of change does take place and especially over time, like nowadays almost all Protestants have a Zwinglian interpretation, even if Calvin and Luther didn't themselves. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, I don't want to, um, because we're both kind of referring to stuff that others have said, and, and I don't mm. myself really understand it all. But I would say that, you know, beyond just Aquinas, however we understand Aquinas, there was a piety. And that's frankly, as a cultural historian, yeah. what I'm more interested in than sure. like, I know, you know you mean. this is yeah. the doctrine we go to, and that's enough for us. There was a piety in the in the period before Luther, uh, where people would actually see on the altar table, the consecrated Eucharist bleeding like it would be like it would there would be blood there because this really is the body of Christ materially after all that kind of piety you know is a different kind of piety than we have in the first millennium for sure and it was certainly a piety against which the protestants like calvin wanted to reform the church mm -hmm. but when it comes to calvin as much as you know you you you're you know you're definitely right that he was he was trying to expand sacramentality around the eucharist and that he could even maybe um accommodate some sort of presence that presence was limited to a spiritual versus material presence for calvin and if we exclude matter the physical creation we're no longer talking about we're talking about a negative cosmology god mm -hmm. created the world as a physical thing and gave us human bodies that are physical that are called to participate in our sanctification alongside our minds and souls and that's one of the things that Protestantism, Protestantism did in the person of Calvin and his theology is it prepared the way for the Gnostic um, Christianity that would follow the Enlightenment, the kind of it's all in the mind that Christianity is really just a, a series of doctrines that I assent to, um, or my worship is to sit down and just listen to someone ex explicate the scriptures in my in my church, you know, the four walls and a and a pulpit kind of model of. And no longer is there, is there this transformation, a heavenly transformation of the world, where the world is being transformed by the sacramental presence of the incarnate God. It's now being boxed in 
around largely mental and non-physical and therefore non, you know, non-cosmic elements. And I think that that really is a, a long-term consequence of the, of the papal um, reformation that we've, we've spoke about in our, in our talk today. And, and that is uh, a, an interesting thing is, is maybe almost Aquinas could get some of the blame himself in splitting apart accidents and substance, because that's sort of in his own model, that is sort of accidents are what you see and what you touch and what it looks like, right? And mm -hmm. substance is only apprehended by the mind. So the, the in here versus out there split is actually kind of there in Aquinas's own language. And is it not, you know, a legacy of scholasticism, a legacy of this really a philosophical approach to understanding and getting the mind around what in the Greek language is called a mystery. You know, we, we use the word sacrament in English, but the Greek word for sacrament is mystery. Mm -hmm. um, Tainstva in, uh, in, in Slavonic, you know, the Orthodox Church in Russia uses the same word. And the first millennium, there was really no effort to get the mind around and explain what this mystery is all about it was just affirmed this truly is the body and blood of christ mm -hmm. and now aquinas tries to clarify it with accidents and substance and and then, although the debate had started a little bit before him but but yeah he, he he's oh. responding to questions but yeah I, I i see what you're talking about and and i agree even if we could say some protestants even still to this day have a more real and active sense of how they theologically describe christ's presence in the eucharist then i think sometimes is often misunderstood i do agree with you that there is a huge shift in i think really all of protestantism to focusing on the transformation of the person kind of through their mind as opposed to this happening by the actions that are performed in the liturgy of the church and that's why church becomes more focused in Protestantism, both on preaching, uh, which is, you know, trying to exhort people and inform people in a way that transforms their person, but also music. I, I would say that really kind of for Protestantism, what takes the place of liturgical sacramentalism is sort of a that that energy then gets focused on music, which is also a very mental and sort of personal transformative thing, but also a communal transformative thing because singing together is a very powerful experience. But sort of it, the Do you think that music really I mean, there's a I know that in some circles anyway, there's an emphasis upon music that stirs one's feelings, one's yes. emotional, yes. The, one's sentiments. Yes, yes. And yeah. and I think that like if you look in American Protestantism, like when churches tr do surveys of why did you come here? Why are you staying here? Why did you leave? And why did you go to a different church to try and improve themselves? What often rises to the top of those surveys is music. A, I liked the music here, or B, I left because I didn't like the music here. I liked the music better at your neighboring uh -huh. church. And that really, I think, not that, I mean, obviously Catholicism and Orthodoxy have music and have a role for music in their services. So it's not like Protestantism invented music inside Christian services, but like you often say, a lot of these things are a matter of emphasis and attention as opposed to hard and fast distinctions, right? And so Protestantism really comes to emphasize music as its transformative thing. And every time there's a Protestant revival of some kind or a new Protestant denomination or a strong Protestant movement, whether it was, you know, Luther himself was a hymn writer, the Wesley brothers were also hymn writers, yeah. um, Pentecostalism writes its own new music, African-American Christianity is very music centric. And then sort yeah. of even evangelical 20th century American Christianity has its own genre of music. And I think that's very much because music helps capture the spirit of what's going on in the church and helps give a cohesive identity to expressing things that can't be expressed just purely by a sermon. And that music, like when you ask a Protestantism, oh, I'm, yeah, oh, now we're entering our period of worship in our service. It's not the Eucharist that is the worship period. It worship is singing. And uh, at church, I've been a worship leader before. That doesn't mean I administer the sacrament. It means I play guitar on the stage, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so that, that emphasis on music, I think, is really kind of what takes, uh, what, what, what stirs the emotions for Protestants in a way that sort of replaced the sacramental emphasis of worship that was more historic before that. I think that's interesting, Sam. That's really interesting. It's like two, like if you can, if one can, and this is often done, it's, it's, it's not um, very uh, sophisticated, but 
I think one often distinguishes between the rational and the uh, emotive faculties mm -hmm. of a person, right? And, and I think what you're saying here is that the Protestantism kind of appeals to both of those faculties, the, the one, the former by, by through sermons and reflection on scripture, Mm -hmm. um, doctrinally, uh, and in Bible doctrine, studies and that sort of thing, established mm -hmm. Bible studies. And the other is by music that makes us, you know, makes one feel a certain way. That's very mm -hmm. interesting, I think. And, 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 and both of those could be in principle sacramental, but in practice perhaps are, are less so certainly in comparison to traditional Christianity and it's, it's Orthodox or Roman Catholic forms. Yeah. Or yeah. even Lutheran. I mean, even Lutheran probably forms. Yeah. L Lutheranism has great music. <laughs> yeah. I, I have to give them that credit. Like, you know, if I go to St. Olaf's choir in, in Minnesota, they're, they're, it's fabulously good music. And so a lot of, because there is no more, there's less of an emphasis on art, right? Be it in iconography or elaborate sort of decoration of, of uh, churches and cathedrals and temples. And since architecture is also not very, I mean, some Protestant churches are pretty architecturally complex, but in general, there's less of an emphasis on architecture. A lot of the artistic energy gets funneled into music. Mm -hmm. And often in a way that's very concentrated on stirring the emotions and creating the right mindset and connecting people with Jesus and giving them a strong sense of redemption and, and, and all of that sort of thing. And various different kinds of Protestantism have different flavors of music that reflect differences in sort of their emphases doctrinally and, and that sort of thing, too. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Um, but I guess sort of I... I, I <laughs> We, I guess we need to probably close up on talking about what you mean by the age of utopia. And so we, we've sort of covered, you know, a lot of the previous eras. And then your, your most recent book is the age of utopia. And so, so what do you mean by utopia and a utopic, if that's the right word, focused Christianity compared to a paradisically, if I'm saying that right, oriented Christianity? Yeah, well, okay, so I, I do try to make this distinction. And of course, historians put together, they, they coin phrases or they use phrases in certain ways that are in, I call them interpretive devices. You know, this is not necessarily, if we went back in time and talked to a, um, a, you know, a, a first millennium Christian, you know, and we said, well, you know, you practice traditional Christianity, right? They wouldn't know what we're talking about. Uh, it, uh, so this, but it's useful for an historian to try to create, um, terms a terminology that makes that helps us make sense of the historical record and its narrative so what i do is in the in the in the first book age of paradise i speak of traditional christianity as an orthodox christian i consider orthodoxy cr traditional christianity and vice versa but i want to certainly open and, and and honor and accommodate other people who are not orthodox in the second volume, I introduce a um, term called reformational Christianity to define that part of Western Roman Catholic traditional Christianity became in influenced by reformational logic and thinking. I think that that form of Christianity, reformational Christianity reached a peak in the uh, Protestant Reformation and, um, and, and then kind of crashed in the 17th century with the terrible wars of Western religion. These wars are often called the wars of religion by itself because most people are talking about them are Western and you don't need that. Mm -hmm. But an Orthodox Christian never participated, Orthodox Church never participated in these wars of religion. Mm -hmm. And so they're really better known as the wars of Western religion where Roman Catholics and Protestants fought each other in pitched battles over the course of a century and a half. The yeah. worst um, war being the 30 years war. And finally, it came to an end. And, P and in the West, Protestants and Roman Catholics were so exhausted by the reformational energy of their Christianity, which led them to even fight wars, that they just, Christianity in the West just kind of lost its strength. Um, reformational Christianity would continue in, in you know, like the, the uh, so-called neo-orthodoxy of Karl Barth in the 20th century and, and more recent ex expressions of neo-Calvinism and so forth. It's clear revival of reformational Christianity in its Calvinistic you know, form, for instance. But I think that once in the 17th century going into the 18th century, which of course is the century of the so-called enlightenment, uh, where Christianity is just kind of like dismissed altogether as being the core force or influence for our culture in the West, and deism and, 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 and such takes its place, 
what you see is um, the rise of uh, like a, a, a pietistic Christianity, like pietism. Like you just referred to this, I think, when you're talking about the goal of um, some forms of Protestantism is to make one one feel the experience of personal transformation. Mm -hmm. uh, pietism, you know, in the case of Spainer, the the Lutheran um, uh, theologian and writer, <clears throat> who then influenced people like the um, the Methodists, the Wesley brothers, and so forth. Um, uh, these people began to emphasize the individual's experience of salvation, but not to root it in an ecclesiological definition of what the true church is. That no longer seemed viable after, in the wake of the wars of uh, the Western religion, or even in a doctrinal sense, like emphasis on doctrine, because everyone disagrees with each other. You know, that wonderful book called, um, um, I, I've got too much going through my head right now, but um, Brad Gregory's book, um, The Unintended Reformation. I don't know if you've read that, but it's a it's an account of, it's a really great book. He's Roman Catholic, so it has Roman Catholic kind of, you know, logic or thinking behind it, but it's a really great effort to understand postmodernism and pluralism in our present um, culture today by looking at the Protestant Reformation and all the disagreements and controversies that finally couldn't be resolved. And so they, they, they kind of um, spawned a, uh, a, a kind of a mutual agreement, uh, um, a kind of um, uh, uh, sense of just acceptance of, of kind of multiple truths and truth claims. Mm -hmm. Well, pietistic Christianity had this kind of character to it. So you see this in the, re the reform movements in America, the, the revival movements, the first great awakening, right, of the, of the 18th century, the second great awakening of the early 19th century are, are very interdenominational, right? I mm -hmm. mean, they, they bring people of all sorts of theological, ecclesiological, doctrinal backgrounds together in camp revivals where the most important thing is, is proclaiming Jesus as your savior and, and joining with people who have very different beliefs, doctrinally speaking, belong to different mm -hmm. churches, but you're all in the same kind of- You're descent. all in the same tent, at least for a little while, even well, if the next Sunday you might go to different buildings, yeah. That's right, that's right. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a phase in the development of, of what I think is uh, the, the utopian influence on Christianity in the West after the-, uh, after the um, after the uh, the wars of Western religion, but but there, there's another form of Christianity that I th think kind of you know culturally speaking, like this is not a obviously a confessional definition. This is more of a look at at, at Christianity as a cultural force, right? Mm -hmm. Which I call utopian Christianity, and that goes even beyond the Pietistic kind, which is still very centered upon my relationship with Christ, my eternal salvation, stuff like this, my repentance of sin. My internal <laughs> renewing of my own mind, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. And and what I see going on here is that there's a kind of utopian, utopian element where Christianity is more and more assigned and seen legitimately as concerned with making things better in this world, improving the world, appealing to people's experiences in this world, and making them feel more comfortable and more optimistic about those experiences. Mm -hmm. I see this as being like the really the real influence of secular humanism. We haven't talked about its origin. I have a big argument to make about the origin of secularization and secular humanism in the age of utopia. But I think that 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 development, which takes centuries to unfold, finally kind of gets control of Christianity in some forms as well. So that Christianity more and more becomes utopian in its character, by which I mean it's concerned not with the eternal kingdom of heaven that may have broken into this world, but belongs beyond this world, um, but rather this world as an end in itself. Mm -hmm. And we can find in certainly the 20th century, plenty of examples of, you know, Christianity's main re kind of reason for existence is to make you know, to bring about social change, to bring about social like the justice. civil rights movement. Yeah, the civil rights movement would be a big part of that, too. And so, you know, that that I think is is what can be called utopian Christianity. I'm not trying to use polemics here. I'm not trying to dismiss yeah. those, you know, thank God for the civil rights movement. But but I'm just saying, like, I can I just see a different kind of emphasis there. And I'm not sure that that emphasis supports the paradisiacal culture that I see at, at in place in the first millennium. And I think mm -hmm. it, 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 it really just show, 
the influence I, I, of Because honestly, sometimes when I was when I was reading and listening <clears throat> to your podcast, I was like, I'm not quite sure. I, I found myself struggling to understand the difference between that utopic emphasis and the paradisal emphasis. Like, you know, I'm I am uh, I'm about I don't know. 30 or 40 percent ethnically descended from the Puritans, right, who, you know, got on their boats, came over here from England and, you know, set up a uh, shop in Massachusetts. And their goal was to, you know, escape the impurities of what they saw uh, in the English Reformation and create a, no, a good pure church uh, and a good pure society and to be the city on the hill where God is sort of like beaming down from heaven this new pure society and everyone looks to it and sees its self-evident goodness and that then spreads from there by the force of compelling example which is still a huge animating idea in the in america whether people realize that or not that mm -hmm. that puritan ideal and to me i i see what you mean but it, it still seems like it's focused on paradise and their eschatology was a little bit different right they believed that in order for jesus to come back christians had to sort of pave the way and purify um the world to such an extent that then jesus could come back right and and that the quicker they did that the sooner that it would happen right um and and so that sort of eschatological oomph and weight on it was a little bit different than in a uh, eastern orthodox setting where that isn't quite the same eschatology but but the the idea that there's something pure up he, up in heaven that we're bringing it down it comes to us through us and in our church and then it radiates from us into our society and then from our society into the other societies it seems very similar to me and almost as if that were a recovery of that same idea so i i guess it, it could maybe help me understand and, and maybe even help me buy into this distinction a little bit because it seems quite similar to me well yeah and and, and sam I, I agree with what you're saying there um the puritan experiment of new england is the is the final gasp of reformational christianity not not mm -hmm. pietistic and certainly not utopian christianity as i'm conceiving of these different kind of tendencies of Christianity in, in, in the culture of the West. So I see that as being exactly in line with Calvin and in, in fact uh, with Gregory the Seventh Pope of Rome. And that is to reform society, specifically institutionally to alter things in, in a self-conscious, directed, targeted way, according to some model of what the kingdom of heaven is supposed to be. And, and, and even using force to cause that to happen. You know the puritans were known for this mm -hmm. with their stock stockades and all that stuff yeah so uh there's this there's scarlet a's on the yeah. <laughs> you know so i think that you're i mean so what you just said was an example of what i would what i do call in the age of utopia reformational christianity at work now what's interesting is it exhausted itself just like in the wars of western religion in in the old world which the puritans were trying to set up this kind of you know, kind of bastion of uh, to to re-evangelize the, the the decrepit old Christendom of the of the yeah. We'll make the new world, and the old world will look on it with such envy that it'll then ship backwards across the Atlantic. Yeah. The city on a hill um, mm -hmm. idea there, yeah. Uh, they exhausted themselves, so that by the end of the 1600s, the Puritans are pretty much you know done for. They they can't sustain this highly energized reformational approach. To creating the kingdom of heaven on earth, which had never been really the goal of 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 of, of traditional Christianity or or the first millennium, uh, again, it's not centered on sacramental life. It's not centered upon liturgical worship. It's centered upon you know righteousness. It's centered upon biblical literacy. It's centered upon you know good public order. Um, there was so much in the uh, I mean, there's so much in the Orthodox Church's history of bad public order and you know drunkenness and and all that kind of stuff, but it could still coexist with a culture in which the um, the standard of legitimacy is the presence of the kingdom of heaven in this world, and the calling to repentance of those who, through drunkenness or some other, I mean, read Dostoevsky's novels, you really see it there, like, you know, Marmaladov and Crime and Punishment is this wretched drunken guy 
who's who's always talking about how Christ will come and he will be with me and eschatol it's all eschatological he finally gets run over by a cart um, when he's wandering across the street drunk in, in St. Petersburg he gets killed and leaves a wife and dependent children you know suffering from disease and, and starvation as a result um, it's very Dostoevsky in other words but but this this model of Christendom that I see in the first millennium is not one in which in which reformational actions such as a reforming papacy or reforming theologians or a, a reform reformational city on a hill where we're going to re remove ourselves from the corruption of of England and and and, and Holland and set this perfect society up in America. That's not what I see in the first millennium. There's much more, I, I think there's a freer sense of civilization at that time in the West. And because it's so, um, it's so uh, overmanaged, that Puritan New England really collapses under its own weight. And so you get people like Jonathan Edwards, great example, Jonathan Edwards writes Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, that famous sermon, which is very reformational in character, like God is going to punish you and destroy you, and he's, he's full mm -hmm. of loathing hatred for you. You'd better repent, you know, the yeah. altar call and all that stuff, the, hot, the, uh, the um, anxious seat and all those things that the yeah. revivalists spoke of. At the same time, Jonathan Edwards wrote, and it's been picked up by historians, beautiful accounts of how how America is going to flourish as a the, Cal the, the Puritans were weird that way. They <laughs> they had this extreme optimism and pessimism simultaneously that that it almost doesn't make sense. So it's like, okay, so you're wretched and you're evil and you're entirely sinful, but yet it's entirely on you to build this city on a hill that's going to purify the earth such that the return of Jesus can happen. You know, it, <laughs> it, yeah, it almost yeah. doesn't make sense, but both of those two things were held in a weird tension with each other, and they were both very energizing, I guess, like you said. Yeah, yeah. So, so your example of, you know, Puritan New England, um, I mean, I think that's, a, for me, that's an example of the kind of last gasp of reformational Christendom, the last effort to make that happen in the very unusual circumstances of of, of of the North American colonies, you know, outside mm -hmm. of the historic sphere of Chris, Christian civilization. Mm -hmm. So, so I would say that that's not at all utopian in in the way that I use the term utopian Christianity. Okay, and so so when when does sort of the utopian Christianity um, kind of set in, and what are its distinctives? Well, so in, in the age of utopia, um, I see it really appearing in, in the form of Unitarianism, in, in the form of, yeah. you know, in the early 19th century, and people like William Channing, um, who's such, and, and I'd like to hear from you, Sam, you know, obviously, a lot more than I do about this topic, like what the different variations of Unitarian thought are, and where, what kind of cultural impact they have on, on 19th century and beyond um, American culture. But but certainly William Channing um, as a figure is interesting because on the one hand, it's all about this world. It's all about, it's all about the, um, the seculum. It's all about this world. It's, it's all not about, about eminence right now. Yeah. Eminence. Yeah. You could use that mm -hmm. term. Um, but what's interesting about him is he's speaking the language of, of traditional Christianity to do so. And I, by this, I mean like the Greek fathers, deification, the presence of Christ in this world, our um, our immediate communion with God, um, you know that God is not this uh, malevolent or or um, uh, threatening, angry father figure that the way Calvin might have described him or Jonathan Edwards did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but rather he's within you and and wants to have communion with you and make you experience in this world, his beautiful and glorious presence. And he wants you to participate with him, like that language of participation. Yeah, it's so important in, in in Orthodox Christianity and in the first millennium. This is all over the place. In Basil the Great and other of those Greek fathers, we participate in the divinity of, of God. 
And that's, I mean, if you tell me, I think yeah, that's what yeah. William Channing was trying to say. So I, I should say I'm like not a direct theological descendant of William Ellery Channing, but I, I know him and I've read him and I admire him a lot. The weird thing is, is in America, Unitarianism has crept up multiple times, right? Like, especially in Protestantism, that's very sola scriptura, get back to the Bible, restorationist, we need to believe what the first century church believed. And that, that kind of fervor has happened multiple times in American Protestantism, and almost inevitably there will be one or two branches of that that become Unitarian, because they would say, well, it seems like the doctrine of the Trinity developed over time, you know, so that means if you go back earlier in time, then it's not there, right? So that, that, that's part of what um, causes Unitarianism to pop up multiple times in restorationistly oriented Christianity, especially in the United States, where there's no state church telling you that you can't be, you know, you can't, you have to be Trinitarian. In England, mm -hmm. there were blasphemy laws requiring belief in the Trinity until the mid to late 1800s or something like that. Whereas in America with freedom of religion, there is no legal consequence, there still might be a social consequence uh, um, to non Trinitarianism, but without legal consequence, it, it's much easier for it to pop up. So the like, I've been to conferences of, of Unitarians, and there's like sometimes four or five or six different independent traditions mm -hmm. represented. And we're like, okay, so, so we have our differences on on this, that or the other thing because of our, our histories and our independent trajectories, but we agree about this thing. Um, but so but regarding kind of New England Unitarianism, which has its roots, like, Unitarianism was there from the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. It just had to hide and run lots of times, right? It was in Italy, Socinus was in Italy, and then he got kicked out of Italy, he went to Poland. There was like a 70 or 80 year Unitarian reign in Poland, which actually most people don't know about. And then, you know, the, the Catholic or the Poles and the Swedes go to war and the, the Catholic Polish people are suspicious of the Protestant Polish people because they're worried they're going to ally with with Lutheran Sweden, right? And so then a persecution emerges of the Unitarians in Poland. So then they run to Romania and there actually actually still are a good number of Unitarians in Romania, which most people don't know. But then that idea kind of spreads to England and it's underground in England for a while and people like Isaac Newton and John Locke. Mm -hmm. And also yeah. who's reading John Locke all the time? the American founding fathers. Yeah. So then in 1770-ish, mm -hmm. there starts to be a growing presence of Unitarianism in the United States, mainly under the influence of John Locke and other English enlightenment -y sort of people. Um, and then in Boston, by about 1800, it really starts to explode. I think between 1800 and 1820, something like 90% of the Puritan churches in Boston switch from Trinitarian Calvinist to Unitarian. Right, uh -huh. which is like 90% or something like that in just a couple decades. And then shortly after that, Harvard uh, Divinity School is officially Unitarian, et cetera. And then there are other things. But anyway, back to William Mallory Channing, the thing that I think is really interesting is you're right, there are a lot of interesting similarities between William Mallory Channing and Eastern spirituality. The positive um, anthropology. You know, that's one of the clearest things in William Mallory Channing is he's clearly reacting against Calvinist negative anthropology and being like, no, the destiny of humans is likeness unto God. And his, you have mentioned that, that sermon in one of your podcast episodes. That's just a pure articulation of the doctrine of theosis just in American 1800s Boston accent. Right, this idea that we grow in divinity and that our grow our, our goal is to participate in the the divinity of God, mm -hmm. and you might say, well, how can Unitarians believe that if we don't think Jesus is God, or at least not in the same way? And for us, if you think that Jesus was merely a man, you can't have very negative of an anthropology, right? Because salvation happens through a man ascending to participation in divinity. So you can't not think that that's possible and have an atonement theory involving a human Jesus, right? And so the lack of incarnational theory prevents a negative anthropology in, in Unitarianism because how if you have a negative anthropology like Calvin had, how could a human accomplish what Jesus accomplished, right? And so that is really what opens the door to positive anthropology and to the doctrine of theosis, because we would basically say, like, instead of Athanasius saying God became man so that man might become God, we would say something like, 
Jesus, the son of God, became God so that we might become God in brothers with him or something like that. Sort mm -hmm. of Jesus is the first human to achieve theosis and opens the door for the rest of humanity to follow him. So, <clears throat> so that that's sort of that utopian thing is if you believe in the possibility of how Jesus ascended to where he is now in glorified theosified state at the right hand of God the Father with all authority in heaven and earth given to him, that sort of creates, I think, this sort of optimistic thing of what can happen through human effort. And sometimes it can border on Pelagianism, which is something that the Calvinists always like to remind us of because they're always accusing everyone of Pelagianism. But, but that, that, I think, is sort of how that happens. And then this also this re-emphasizing of the kingdom of God which is something like I talked about at the beginning, which instead of our destiny of dying and going to heaven, our destiny is to be resurrected and to participate in Jesus's reign of the kingdom of God here on earth, right? Like, and so that is how I think kind of in a weird way of the horseshoes, the ends of the horseshoe starting to look like each other with Eastern Orthodoxy all the way over here and Unitarianism all the way over here, there's some weird ways in which it gets kind of similar again, even though we're going to have our disagreements, especially over the incarnation and the Trinity. But but mm -hmm. that's how I would sort of explain that. I don't know if that answered your question, but um, it does help. Yeah. No, thank you. Yeah. I think, you know, yeah, the Orthodox would say the incarnation is the necessary um, precondition for the deification of the human being. And, and in my case, as a cultural historian, <clears throat> the um, the creation of a paradisiacal culture where the communion with God is a living kind of regular, especially liturgically, sacramentally defined experience. Um, and without the, without, without God descending, he can't ascend. You know, there's that, that, that scriptural mm -hmm. passage. Orthodox Christians just heard this uh, recently, um, at least on the new calendar, they heard this recently on a Sunday reading that, that Christ descended in order that he might ascend and bring the human race. He descended from heaven that he might, you know, fill all fill all creation with himself and that then he therefore ascended bringing uh the human being into the fullness of the experience of divinity and and so the incarnation would be absolutely necessary as i've understood the yeah. um, development of a paradisiacal culture with its optimistic or positive view of man that you described there but it is interesting how there's some similarities there mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, but we we should probably wrap up. We we almost doubled our sort of budgeted uh, amount of time. But but this has been a really a really great conversation. I guess are there are there any kind of closing thoughts or anything you want to add um, uh, that that we haven't covered yet? No, I I, I um, but I would like to learn more about uh, about you know American Christianity. I've, I've been trained mainly as someone who. You know, has that only kind of on the periphery. So some of the things you said today, I'm going to be working on and thinking about as I write my final volume, but beyond that as well. So thank you for for, for helping me understand that a little bit better. Yeah, well, well, thank you, Father John. Thank you uh, again. I, I'll, I'll put links to your podcast and your books in the description for this video. And I, I feel like I, I, I've learned a lot. Sometimes I felt a little bit challenged or a little bit tugged in a certain way, uh, but I, that, that's some, one of the best ways to learn. So I really appreciate our, our conversation today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sam. Real good to be with you today.